Hi, everybody. Uh, I don't want you to panic, but both of our scripture readings today are from the Old Testament. Uh, sometimes people hear, oh, the Old Testament, we're, we're going to get it today, but no, that's all right. All right. Just nothing to fear because today we are talking about fear. Our opening scripture comes from Psalm chapter 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Surion like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of, of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all say, Glory! The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as kings forever. May the Lord give strength of, to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. And our... Second reading today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 1 to 7. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my sight, and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar away, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So yeah, we're talking today about fear. And fear, it's a funny thing when you really think about it. Not knock, knock, who's there funny, you know, not like that, but more of like an ironic funny. There's a Dave Matthews band song called Funny the Way It Is. And I feel like it kind of does talk about the irony of things because it says funny the way it is. If you think about it, one kid walks 10 miles to school, another's dropping out. So fear is kind of like that kind of funny, irony. We did a Bible study on fear just last year, and I'm not going to play all my cards just yet. I don't want to give you permission to space out for the next 20 minutes or turn the video off, but our study started with Jesus calming a storm on the sea and walking on water. And we came to the conclusion, why should we fear a storm when we should be fearing the one who has authority over the storm? Because uh, the disciples, they were crossing the sea and there was this giant storm. And Jesus actually calmed the storm and he was walking on water towards their boat and they thought it was a ghost. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. It's uh, me, Jesus. And that's when he had Peter walk on water with him. And then in lesson three of our Bible study, it provided us with Proverbs chapter eight, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate. So fear of the Lord is not a literal fear because we always hear we're supposed to fear the Lord. It's not like, a, oh no, God's going to spite me fear. It's a respect fear, giving respect to God to walk in his ways, respect his direction for us. So here is the funny thing about fear. It's a natural instinct. It's a survival mechanism. It's God-given. 
it's what triggers our fight or flight response that's in our brains. It's also what we call common sense. It creates common sense. Because Proverbs chapter 22 verse 3 says, The clever see danger and hide, but the simple go on and suffer for it. So fear is a God-given instinct. It says, I see a bear. Maybe I should lay low and not go and poke it. Or this road, uh, people drive pretty fast on it. I should look both ways before I cross it. Or I have this growth. Maybe I should go to the doctor and get it checked out. That's not living in fear as in, oh, I'm going to lay low and never live my life. But it's being smart. It's using common sense. There's a bear, don't poke it. There's a road, look both ways before you cross it. There's a health concern, doctors exist for a reason. So those things are a God-given instinct. But that survival instinct can actually stop people from doing God's will. The very next verse of that Proverbs, chapter 22, verse 4, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. So spreading the gospel it can be scary. This can be something that strikes a little bit of anxiety in people. What will people think of me if I talk about God to them? What will people think when I turn down their offer to go out and party? Or what if I get hurt going on that missions trip? Maybe I should just stay home. Those are the kinds of fears we need to overcome. Fear is good and fear is bad. Ultimately, I believe fear should not really go past that survival instinct. Think of a battle. A soldier, they feel fear as bullets whiz past them. I'm sure they do. But if they are struck by fear and quit moving, then they very likely will also be struck by one of those bullets. Fear is something we have to quickly turn over to God. Even when we have that growth, even when we see a bear, we should go to God in prayer over that. God protect me. Because the question is, how do we turn that fear over to God? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And as Isaiah 43 points out, we need not fear death. Because our creator is also our redeemer. Verse 2 of uh, Isaiah 43. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Obviously, this was alluding to the exile as the Hebrews were crossing the Red Sea and as they were wandering through the desert. That's what Isaiah is talking about here. God delivered them, and Isaiah wrote that God is still delivering in his day. And, spoiler alert, God is still delivering and protecting us today. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, uh, talking about the desert and all that, uh, God even tried to explain that, you want to know why I'm leading you through the desert? It's because I wanted you to avoid the Philistines. If you walked through the Philistines area, they would have attacked you. You would have seen war and you would have went right back to Egypt. So God's saying, this is why you're in the desert. But the Hebrews, they kept complaining about the desert, uh, even though it was the safest route. But God has reasons for things, and we need to remember that. When something maybe isn't quite going our way or going as planned, if we're afraid that things are not going well in our lives, we need to remember God has a reason for things. According to Isaiah 43, 4, we are precious in God's sight. God loves us. We're his creation. We're his children. We don't need to fear because God is with us. And the Bible, it talks about God actually being like a mother hen, draping the uh, wings over the chicklets, just like a hen does with her children, with her chicks. God, that's what God does with us. He's protecting us with his mighty wings. And that's hard to remember when we're in the midst of anxiety. So something's wrong at work or a child has an illness. Anxiety strikes up. We get concerned. But no matter what's wrong, we need to remember that God loves his creation. He's with us every step of the way. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 12. 
Finally, be strong in the Lord and in strength of his power. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We do not face flesh and blood opponents in this world. That's what's in front of us. We see flesh and blood things. We see physical things in front of us, but that's actually not what we're facing. Now, we're facing spiritual forces. Even the flesh and blood that we face, that is still corrupted by Satan. Satan has all these tricks up his sleeves to try to manipulate people, try to attract them to do his will. And Ephesians 6, 11, that verse that uh, I skipped over there, um, it calls it the wiles of the devil. That passage says that those wiles, they lead rulers, they lead authorities. These are the cosmic powers, the spiritual forces of evil that are manipulating people. We can't put our trust in flesh and blood rulers or authorities. We can't put our trust in presidents, in Congress, not even in preachers, not even in activists, not even in those social media influencers that we know are so wise. That was a joke. They are flesh and blood. They are flawed, like the rest of humanity. I, as a pastor, I am flesh and blood. I am flawed. But God is a spiritual force that is perfect, that is righteous at all times. And we need to realize we cannot fight these spiritual forces alone. We need to use the Spirit of God to fight these evil spirits we face every single day. Christ, he already beat these evil forces in his act of sacrifice and resurrection. But they're still putting up that last-ditch effort to drag each and every one of us down with them. But we are saved by free, free grace. God gives us the power to fight these forces. But it's up to us if we use it or not. It's up to us if we turn to God to look for that protection and that power. That's exactly why we need to stop thinking so highly of ourselves. The glory is due to God. Every victory we have over sin, that is a victory that is due to God. He deserves our admiration. He deserves our worship. In the time of uh, writing Psalms 29, people, they tended to be polytheistic. They saw many gods as being real and equal. And today, we like to put ourselves on a pedestal. We worship our modernity. So we're not worshiping these other gods per se, but we walk around like, look at all the technology that we created. Look at what all we've discovered about the world. Look at all the problems we have solved. We are modern and we are smart. We are wise. Look at all the knowledge we've unlocked. But God's what really deserves our real admiration. Because that modernity that we get so wrapped up in, that's a false idol. God is powerful and God is majestic. His voice is what Psalm likens to wildfires, earthquakes, hurricanes, mighty hurricanes. And as I looked into Psalms 29 for this uh, message, I looked a little deeper into it. I was fascinated by the fact that it actually mirrors a hymn for the false idol Baal, the, the other god that these polytheistic people would worship. And in this chapter, God's using the powers of those pagan gods. This is saying to those Canaanites that it was written to and uh, written about that, oh, you think you have a sun god called Shemesh. And Baal, the storm god, he uses lightning. And Neruda, he uses the waters. And I read a commentator named Fem Perkins who wrote that these ancient writings treated the pagan gods as real because they actually were real. They were demons at work. So they weren't gods. They weren't mighty gods, but they were evil spirits at work, drawing people away. Today we think, oh, those were false gods. They never existed. They weren't real. But if you read these passages, they actually treat them as real because they were deceptive spirits at work, leading people astray and just leading people away from the one true God. And sure, think about it. Money is not real. It's not a living thing. 
but it sure does manipulate people and change them to do things they normally wouldn't do. But our God harnesses all those elements of the pagan gods and use them, and even more. To continue with the modern idol money, sure, it can buy you out of debt when you save enough of it. But God paid a greater debt. So it's still true today. And Psalm says the Lord grants us strength in him. So we don't need to fear his wrath. Because when we think of, you know, sometimes fearing God, it's, oh, lightning bolts raining down every time we go astray. But no, we do not need to fear his wrath. We don't need to fear that power as in fearing that he will use it against us. Instead, we have peace in him. When we fear God, we respect his might. Our fearing God is what leads us to peace. So fear is a reminder that actually we need God. There's still a very big need in our lives for God. So fear is something that can actually be a positive if used properly. It's a positive in a sense because it humbles us. It teaches us. It can even drive us. I have to admit, a fear of failure, that's driven me a lot in my life. It's driven me to try harder, to not accept good enough, to expect more out of myself because I didn't want to fail. I didn't want to fail my parents. I didn't want to fail my teachers. I didn't want to fail myself. I still don't want to fail my wife. And I've never wanted to fail God. So it's driven me to be the best version of myself. Think about wise people that keep a rainy day fund. So they save for retirement and for these unpredictable moments in life. They have some extra money instead of going out and buying it on a speedboat or uh, a fancy car. They have put a rainy day fund aside and also save for retirement. That is utilizing Proverbs 22.3. They see a potential danger, those unknown things. They see the fact that they won't have an income later in life from a job. So they store some money away. It's the rainy day fund. But what do we give power to? That's the greater question. Do we give it to fear or do we give that power to God? Do we hoard all of our money in fear of the unknown and never give to those that don't have money at all? Do we dwell on everything that can go wrong so we never take chances to do what is right, like a missions trip? Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. We shouldn't fear the storm. We should fear the one who has power over the storm. We have to remember what we give power to. Because those powers of darkness, they are very real. They are so much at work in our world. Just as the ancient people treated false idols as real, we have to remember that our modern false idols are also real in the same sense. They are not gods, they're not sentient beings, but they are tools used by evil cosmic forces. Do we give power to God or to the powers of evil? It's as simple as that. That's the if and situation. One last thing I wanted to add to this though. People that fight mental battles that we know nothing about, we need to be aware of them. Because people, they battle PTSD, bipolar disorder, and a vast amount of different anxiety disorders. And we need to be very aware and very sympathetic to that. Because 47,511 people committed suicide in the United States in 2019. 47,511. It was the 10th leading cause of death that year. And that comes from the National Institute of Mental Health. So that's a very real statistic. This message is not to overlook or belittle any of those conditions. I encourage those that are dealing with these hidden battles to not make them hidden. Open up to those you trust. And if you need to, seek professional help. There's nothing to be ashamed of with that. And for those that are opened up to, I encourage you to 
do not belittle those concerns people are opening up to you with because that trust they are putting in you is something very sacred. Do not abuse that. God is gifting you the opportunity to help these people conquer fears through him. Mental health is not something that people can just get over. It's not, oh, just, just ride it out. It'll get better. No. Actually listen to their concerns. Listen to their hurts. Because we don't tell cancer patients that it's no big deal. We don't tell cancer patient, patients that you're just worrying about it too much. These are real disorders with people who are really hurting. So listen. Don't just hear them. Listen. Respect those that are speaking to you. Because Jesus said at the Sermon on the Mount that the poor in spirit and those who mourn and those that are persecuted are blessed, right along with the meek, righteous, pure, and the peacemakers. So those people that are poor in spirit, those who are mourning, those that are hurting, you can be that blessing to them. And for everybody listening to this, turn your fears over to God. Because God is all we need to fear. Be wise. Use those survival instincts that God put into you, but do not live in fear. Do not give power to it. Get help when you need help. And help those that need your help. And as always, may God receive all the glory for every victory. Remember, God loves you. I love you. Have a great day.